Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 17th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week, Ray Daniels joins us to talk about beer education. Ray has founded the Cicerone program, which is aimed at improving the education awareness of those who sell and serve our beer. While we have him on the line, we'll also talk about educational opportunities for home and professional brewers. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And we still have the brewer's logbooks in stock for a while at least. I haven't decided whether I'm going to, you know, reorder or not. So, get them while you can. Congratulations to uh, Jeff and Greg of Craft Beer Radio for achieving their 100-episode milestone. Jeff and Greg are beer podcast veterans who've been helping to pave the way for the genre for the past three years. When I posted the first episode of this podcast, Jeff Bear of Craft Beer Radio and Jeffrey T. of The Good Beer Show both wrote to me to welcome me to the neighborhood, so to speak, and that was pretty cool, I thought. Uh, of course, now the neighborhood is more like a subdivision, <laughs> and it's it's good to see that there are, are still some of the old-timers around. Well, before I jump into the mailbag, I want to announce a little contest. Uh, the folks who make the brew hauler, that's the nifty, strappy thing that you fit onto your glass carboys to help you carry them around more safely and easily, uh, you, you see it on the um, lagering, the low-tech lagering and uh, decoction mashing DVD. Anyway, the Brew Hauler folks, they heard me talk about their product on our, our Brewing Disaster show a few episodes ago. And they were so excited that they've sent me a bunch of uh, Brew Haulers to give out. So uh, I've decided to have a little fun and have a contest. It's uh, open to anyone who listens, and we'll have an episode to judge the winners. Well, here's the contest, essentially. Complete the following phrase. You know you're a home brewer when... Kind of a Jeff... Uh, Foxworthy thing there, but uh, you know you're a home brewer when. Now, one-liners are fine, but you get extra credit if you have a story to back it up. For instance, you know you're a home brewer when you find yourself in your suit digging in the trash after a wedding to find the good bottles. That <laughs> that was me essentially dumpster diving for uh, champagne bottles after a friend's wedding because I had a batch of sparkling mead back home in the carboy that needed a place to go. So, there you go. That's my story. So there's your challenge. Send your entries to james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please check your address to make sure it's correct and uh, give us your your where you are. Tell us where you, you're writing from. And we'll judge the entries on the show. And the uh, top ten get brew haulers courtesy of the brew hauler people. So... Uh, the, the contest, once again, you know you're a home brewer when. If you'll remember last uh, episode, uh, Harp from Alabama asked if there were devices out there to monitor the temperature of a room over time because he wanted to see if it would be good to store or ferment beer in a particular room. I got uh, several responses. Chris from Yorktown, Virginia writes, one way of monitoring temperature over a period of time is to use a webcam pointed at your carboy thermometer or any other household thermometer. Have the computer take still pictures at every half hour or so, and over the period of a day or two, you'll have a good indication of the temperature variation. That's a pretty creative solution. Ben from Newcastle, Australia writes, I've seen a little device about the size of a USB memory stick, and it will connect to your PC to view the data. It's manufactured by a company called Lascar, L-A-S-C-A-R. Uh, Joel from Pinckney, Michigan writes, one of the most or on the most recent podcast, you asked how people were monitoring temperature changes. I use the Thermocron from Dallas Semiconductor. Joel says, basically, it's a sensor about the size of six or so quarters. It can be set through a computer to periodically log, log temperatures then can connect back to the computer to retrieve the data for graphs and whatever else. I have one of these and have rotated it through different places in the basement until I figured out where to put my carboy while it was fermenting. 
So Joel's actually used uh, this uh, Thermocron device for his homebrewing, so I guess it works. Bill from Maui, Hawaii, had uh, probably the simplest solution of all those that I got. Bill says you can purchase a simple digital high-low thermometer at your garden shop for about 20 to 30 bucks. Mine is an indoor-outdoor, so it records uh, from the unit location and from a remote probe, so you can sample from two different areas at the same time. It gives the current temperature and the maximum high and low since the last reset. Mine is a, an Accurite, A-C-U-R-I-T-E, and I bought it at Lowe's. So there you go. Very nice, everybody. Thanks to everybody who wrote in suggestions. And I've forwarded them all to uh, Harp down there in Alabama, and I hope he'll find something that fits what he's looking for. It's good to have good to have buddies out there who know stuff and are willing to send it in. We also had a lot of good feedback from our talk with uh, Joel uh, John Owen about sourdough bread. I said at the beginning of that show that I, I knew it wasn't beer, <laughs> but I thought it would be useful in getting to know yeast a little better. And frankly, I just thought it would be a cool topic to talk about, something that I wanted to know myself. Um, Josh from Oregon writes, uh, to the sourdough baking discussion, you should add a link to uh, breadtopia.com to your uh, podcast listing. Breadtopia is by far the best resource on the web for videos on how to make and maintain sourdough. And I took a quick peek at that, and there's videos, free videos online on on making bread. Breadtopia.com. Jason from Erie, Pennsylvania writes, Is it really safe to have a sourdough culture growing in your kitchen if that's where you brew and ferment? Wouldn't those wild yeast spores be everywhere? And John Owen replies, With careful sanitation, I've not yet had an issue with cross-contamination between my bread starter and my beer. As part of my pre-brew cleaning, I wipe down all flat and hard surfaces with a Clorox wipe or with bleach water, and the two processes share no equipment. For the casual extract brewer slash mini mash like myself, that seems to be enough. Pete from Oxford in the UK writes, You might be interested to learn of my experiment using a standard sourdough starter to ferment beer. Initially, the result was very exciting, both fruity and sour, from a low bitter wort recipe, original gravity 1055. So I put it away to mature for six months. Sadly, other bacteria had come into play and the result was highly phenolic in flavor. Pete says, I'll try this again, as the initial taste was spot on, but will stabilize the result somehow, maybe by pasteurization. So that's pretty cool. That's one question that that we didn't get into that I meant to and forgot last time, frankly. So uh, I appreciate Pete uh, sending that in. It sounds like like if you drank the beer quickly, (laughs) which is usually, you know, the practice around here, uh, that um, you'd come up with an interesting beer using the sourdough bread starter to ferment the beer. Well, that's just a just a slice, as it were, of the of the bread letters that uh, came to the mailbag. And it's good to know the show generated um, a lot of interest, and I appreciate uh, John Owen's help in fielding the comments and questions that you guys sent in. Uh, last show, we also had a letter from Derek from Salt Lake City saying he wanted to get into all grain brewing and had $1,000 to spend. Well, Jeremy from Horseshoe Bend, Idaho, writes, My opinion is to start with fermentation temperature control and possibly a kegerator. The all-grain setup can be made rather inexpensively, and it can grow over time. However, the temperature control will give best results in any style of beer. Well, I agree. I appreciate uh Appreciate uh, Jeremy sending that in. I have to admit that I was focusing just simply on the all-grain components only for the answer to that question. But, you know, Jeremy's got a great point. If you've got the money to spend temperature control and a fridge or a freezer uh, to maintain the temperature of your beer, they're excellent ways to go. Okay, before we're short on time, let's uh, move on to our interview. If you Looked at the editor's column in the most recent issue of uh, Zymergy magazine, you'll see a headline called Calling All Cicerones. It's a story uh, about Ray Daniels' efforts to start a beer education program for servers and sellers of beer. And we caught up with Ray to ask him what it's all about. 
Well, Ray Daniels, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks. Glad to be here. We're here to talk about beer education. And uh, to start, I want to talk about your, your Cicerone program. And, and maybe as an illustration, I want to share a story with you uh, to kind of get us uh, started on the right foot. Uh, a few months ago, my wife and I were celebrating our anniversary at a, uh, a, a pretty nice Italian restaurant here in, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And the waiter came up and my wife said, you know, I, I'd like some wine tonight, but I don't, I don't really know a lot about wine. And the waiter said, oh, we can talk some wine. Do you like, what are you having for dinner? Oh, we got red wine, we got white wine, you like it dry, you like it sweet, you da 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 You know, 10, 15 minutes later, after tasting a little bit, you know, she selected her wine. He, he turned to me and he said, uh, well, what can I get for you, sir? And I said, well, what do you got for beers? <laughs> and he said, oh, we've got everything. <laughs> I love those guys. <laughs> so, so Ray Daniels, if if a waiter told you that he had everything as far as beers, what would you order? Oh, I'd say uh, I'd like a bottle of uh, 1979 Alaskan Smoke Porter, please. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, 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 no, maybe maybe what would be perfect with this is um, uh, a bottle of the. Um, 1983 uh, Thomas Hardy's Ale. That would be great. <laughs> yes. Well, I wound up with a fat tire. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're lucky you didn't wind up with with uh, no, something even uh, more mass market than that. <laughs> I was going to say that's what, usually what they have when they say that. Of exactly. Course. Exactly. Well, they they had sunshine wheat and they had fat tire. And, you know, then the rest of it was, uh, you know, football beer, as, as some other people call it. So so that illustrates, I guess, the, the issue that you're trying to address with the, the Cicerone program. To, tell us about the Cicerone program, how it got started, what is it, and, and yeah, where do we well, go Yeah, well, I, I think that that addresses, that addresses one of the issues, um, which is, you know, server knowledge uh, about beer. And I, I think, uh, and you're, you know, dealing with it in, in that anecdote on the... Um, most ideal side, um, which is, you know, you're just talking about selection and, and getting a nice beer. Um, all too often, I think, as drinkers of quality beer, uh, we all have the experience of going into a bar that has, you know, a bar that's new to us usually, that has a fairly um, interesting-looking beer list, and ordering the beer and finding out that it's just awful, mm. um, that the lines haven't been cleaned or it's the first draw of the day and it's all um, acidic and um, uh, <laughs> or that it's got no head or the glass is dirty or the glass has got ice crystals in it or, you know, a whole litany of sins uh, in beer serving that continue to be uh, found out there, even in bars that have got uh, interesting uh, beer lists. And, you know, it's about time that came to an end. Mm. Um, <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> we know a lot more about the proper ways to serve beer these days uh, than they did back in the 1970s, and, and we'd like to bring uh, the rest of the uh, beer serving world uh, up to speed with that. Um, so I, a lot of it is about uh, basic beer service and, and trying to uh, develop a cadre of beer servers um, at retail uh, that know the right ways to serve beer. And then, you know, as it goes further on, then get into the, some of the more subtle uh, issues and more refined issues of, of pairing beers with foods uh, and things like that. So are you trying to bring beer up to the level that uh, that wine has attained in the last few years? Um, I try to avoid uh, comparisons with wine, but I, I think we're trying to bring uh, beer up to the level uh, that it that it's capable of and, and the level it's deserved. Uh, it deserves. Um, you know, American brewers are making a whole lot of really fantastic beers uh, and a wide range of flavors. I mean, um, I, when I was marketing uh, craft beers for the Brewers Association, my mantra was flavor and diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the two things I think American consumers love about craft beer. Uh, they love the, the, the bold, full flavors, and they love the broad diversity of flavors uh, and beer styles that they can get. Um, so, you know, it, it's about time we, <laughs> we uh, did a better job of, of presenting those. 
Um, so a lot of a lot of ways, this program's about being a brewer's advocate at retail uh, and helping them. Um, sorry, my other phone was ringing there. Uh, help <laughs> helping them do a better job of uh, of uh, not do a better job, but help helping them by by getting retailers to do a better job of of presenting um, the beers. Now, where does where does the term Cicerone come from? Cicerone is a word with with obvious uh, Latin roots. Um, it, it sounds Italian, uh, but e- in fact, it's a word that has uh, more than 400 years of history in the English language. And um, back in uh, back in England, uh, it's still used uh, with some frequency, um, and it denotes an individual who is a knowledgeable or learned uh, guide to arts and antiquities. Um, a sort of tour guide at a at a art museum or history museum. So it is the it is the beer, and again, you you don't want to talk about wine, but is the the beer equivalent of the sommelier? Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly at some level. Um, but again, you know that even that is, and, and you know, I do use that phrase. I say it's yeah, it's a sort of a beer sommelier program. Um, but I think that some people in the beer world take offense uh, even at that concept. Uh, because they see that as trying to make beer, you know, snooty and um, elitist in some way, or, or putting on pretensions. And and I don't think it's about that at all. It's but it is about uh, presenting beer in all its complexity and wonderfulness, and in acknowledging the fact that there's a heck of a lot to know about beer uh, these days. And um, uh, sort of declaring that to the world and saying, look, you know, you can't just be a beer expert because you know how to tap a keg and, and pull a tap uh, mm-hmm. and fill up a glass of beer. Uh, there's a heck of a lot more to it than that. Now, I, I downloaded uh, the outlines for the, the syllab- syllabus. I, or sy- what, is the, what is the plural of syllabus? <laughs> well, I think I, <laughs> syllabi? I, mean, I debate that one every time I have to use it, uh, whether it's syllabuses or syllabi. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, we, have, we have more than one syllabus on the site. That, that's a better way to say it. <laughs> in, uh, the, in the novice syllabus, uh, what do you cover there? Um, well, both, uh, both uh, cover uh, knowledge in uh, five different areas of um, uh, beer and brewing, um, and uh, part of that is uh, the uh, flavor component. Uh, some of it is uh, style knowledge, and uh, I'm pulling up my cheat notes because uh, at the moment the five. <laughs> The five are, are are escaping me immediately. Well, I've got I've got them in front of me. Sir, serving serving beer. Yeah. So so stor- storage uh, sales and service, and this is basic stuff that is like okay, what's the three tier system and why is it important? Um, you know, you got to you got to know how the beer gets to you from the brewer, and that's pretty fundamental knowledge. Um, when the beer comes in the door, you know what should you do with it? What sh- what should you look for? Uh, expiration dates uh, on products. Um, uh, certainly the uh, condition uh, of the stock that you're getting, um, and then what are you going to do with it when you get it? Are you just going to uh, uh, throw it out in the, in the back room that's not air-conditioned in the middle of summer? Uh, just uh, leave it out in the hallway in the basement? Is that good enough? Uh, and what are the effects of uh, the way you handle the beer? Uh, should you stack up those, uh, those imported beers uh, in the window in direct sunlight? Mm. Uh, probably not. Um, so those are obviously fairly extreme examples, but uh, people who are serving beer for a living uh, need to know and uh, remember all the things that uh, can cause beer to, de- to deteriorate uh, when it's in their care. Yeah, it, it doesn't count if you get good beer if you don't take good care of it. Yeah, well, absolutely, and, that, and that's what it's all about. That there's an awful lot of great beer in the United States these days, but, but too often it's, it's um, in very poor shape when it reaches the consumer. Um, so that's the first area is beer storage, sales, and service. Second is beer styles and culture, uh, and those two things go hand in hand, I think. Uh, at the novice level, uh, we focus on uh, just a dozen or 15 uh, beer styles that are pretty much everyday bread and butter uh, styles, you know, pale ale, India pale ale, uh, stout, um, uh, Weiss beer, Bach beer, Pilsner, uh, the, the, the real standard uh, beers that you find uh, pretty commonly, and uh, making sure people understand the basics on those. Um, the third area is beer tasting and flavors. And, uh, you know, it's essential 
uh, for someone who is serving beer to know what um, beer is supposed to taste like. Uh, that sounds kind of silly, but, you know, uh, 25 years ago, it was kind of silly. Everybody knew what beer tasted like. Because um, it all today, tasted the same. A lot of people know what a beer tastes like, or they have some idea of what uh, a particular beer or some beers are supposed to taste like. But uh, all too often, uh, when you're served a beer that's bad, that's kind of an obvious um, flaw in it, uh, servers are completely clueless. It, that flaws can even exist, much less that they might be responsible for uh, causing it and uh, that they should do something about it uh, mm -hmm. as a server, other than tell you that um, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Which is always a good move when you're a server. Yeah, well, yeah, there, there, there are some some larger issues there of, of, uh, of service that that we might not be able to cure with the Cicerone program. Uh, um, so, beer tasting and flavors is the third area. Uh, beer uh, brewing ingredients and processes uh, is the fourth. Um, uh, you know, real basic stuff. Well, what's malt, hops, yeast, and water? How do they get used uh, in making beer? What flavors do they contribute to the finished product? Uh, things like that. And then the final uh, area, the fifth area, is pairing uh, beer and food, and uh, having some some you know fluency with the fact that beer goes well with with food. Uh, just that concept for starters at the novice level, and then as you you move further into the program, uh, really starting to have some uh, some expectations that people would have some understanding of of what sorts of foods go well with what sorts of be beers, and at the top end level, you know, really be fluent and capable of, of matching uh, beers with foods. So there, there's different levels of certification within the program? Yep, three different levels. Uh, first level is certified beer server, and uh, uh, obviously the word Cicerone is not used there, and one of the reasons for that is because the certified beer server exam is given online, it's multiple choice, and so there is no tasting component to the certified beer server exam, it's simply knowledge. Um, starting with the second level, the Certified Cicerone, that will be a face-to-face -face exam with a tasting component uh, to it, and uh, that's uh, what you need to do to get the Certified Cicerone, and then the Master Cicerone is the, uh, the highest level in the program, and that also obviously will be a face-to-face -face exam, uh, and there will be not only a written exam, but also an oral exam and, um, to kind of prove your, prove your mettle with uh, guys who know what they're talking about. And where are those exams going to be given? Well, they'll be given around the United States in different places, uh, usually in connection with uh, restaurant, bar, or brewing industry events. Uh, first uh, certified uh, Cicerone exam is going to be given uh, out in San Diego concurrent with the uh, Craft Brewers Conference in April. And now, now what, what, are these, uh, what, are these, what are these certifications get you? I mean, uh, credibility in seeking employment or... Right. I mean, yeah, it, it is a um, professional uh, credential uh, for people who sell and serve beer. And, you know, some of the, the folks who are most interested in this right now are the breweries and wholesalers themselves, uh, folks who are selling beer on a day-in, day-out basis. And, um, you know, the, the heads of marketing and sales at breweries are calling me and saying, hey, you know, we need to run our, our folks through your program um, because, you know, we've got a bunch of new salespeople and, you know, they know something about beer, but I want to know that they all have a good uh, firm uh, foundation and basis in, in uh, the products that they're selling. And that when they go in to talk to a wholesaler or retailer who really knows beer, uh, that they're going to be at least as well equipped as, as those folks are. Is and I think you find that in the sommelier uh, world as well uh, on the wine side. And here I go making a comparison. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it's a parallel system. Um, that you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people who are going through the program are, are in fact not folks who are working at a restaurant uh, doing table side service, but folks who are selling uh, wine for a living. Hmm. Now, is is there a uh, an existing program like this for beer? No, there is not. So, and this is this is just getting off the ground, is it not? Yep, absolutely. It's an idea that that uh, occurred to me a year or so ago. And I spent some time earlier last year sort of looking into it, thinking about it, uh, letting the idea develop a bit. And um, uh, then I uh, began to do the execution work, and, and the first thing was coming up with, with a name for it. 
Um, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, it's a professional certification. Uh, and in order to have a legitimate certification, you need to bestow on people a title that no one else can use. Mm. And uh, in order to do that, obviously, you have to have legal protection uh, for that name. So the phrase is uh, certified Cicerone and master Cicerone are, in fact, um, uh, trademarked uh, terms. And uh, no one will be allowed to use those uh, without having uh, completed our examination process. Hmm. So, so back to your previous point, I mean, if somebody comes in and, and has on their job resume that they're a certified Cicerone or master Cicerone, then, then the employer can, can have some, some confidence that that person, you know, really knows uh, beer, and not only on the knowledge side but also on the flavor side, and that they've proven that in an objective examination. Um, the same thing, same thing at retail. You know, if you go in and, and, and they've got a Cicerone on staff, certified Cicerone or master Cicerone, then you have some idea that the, the people taking care of the beer at this place know what they're doing. Hmm. And there is a, uh, there is a short uh, sample quiz on the site. Right. The, uh, the sample exam has got 10 questions, all multiple choice. And um, uh, those questions range everything from... Uh, you know, how much beer is in a, in a half keg of, of beer uh, to uh, some, some fairly uh, sophisticated questions regarding the anatomy of a draft system, uh, stuff that, that, you know, the average person wouldn't know unless they'd taken a uh, uh, draft building, draft maintenance uh, sort mm-hmm. of course. And uh, some beer, some, uh, some subtle beer style questions as well. So it's, a, it's a, a combination of questions from what I would consider all three levels of the program. Um, so it gives people a, a little taste of, of what they might be, uh, where they might be in the, the overall spectrum of beer knowledge. And I, I took the quiz. Mm-hmm. How'd you do? I got nine out of ten. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that tripped me up was the uh, the kegging stuff, so... <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe if I worked in a restaurant or or even kegged at home, I would be in better shape. But right, uh, right. Um, well, that sounds good. What what are your goals? I mean, what in in a year's time, what do you hope to have achieved? Well, I think this is a, a program that has um, a very broad base of uh, uh, the certified beer servers, and then narrows pretty quickly as you go up. So uh, I'm I'm expecting that for uh, sort of a thousand uh, certified beer servers, we might have a hundred um, certified cicerones and and maybe as many as ten master cicerones, ultimately. So sort of a tenfold drop off at each level. Um, and I guess you know I, I haven't I haven't articulated this publicly before, and haven't even really written it down to myself, but I've been walking around thinking, uh, if we get about a 1,000 people through the certified beer server exam this year, that would be uh, a pretty good start. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, I just put that exam up on the 3rd of January, and we've already had uh, 30 or 40 people go through, the, go through that exam uh, with more taking it every day. So that's a, a pretty good start on things. Well, well, we'll have to see what kind of impact this show has. We'll yep. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and I'm sure it will, because... Uh, you know, every time there's uh, anything out there uh, about the program, people come to the site and uh, uh, they register as a user, uh, which is something you do need to do to get to the uh, sample exam and a bunch of the other little goodies. Um, and uh, I see the effect of that. Well, I I, uh, I wanted to have you on as well uh, to pick your brain on as many areas as I can while I've got you. Sure. Uh, we, uh, I had a listener write in uh, a couple months ago, I think it was, asking about formal educational opportunities for both home brewers and people who are professional brewers and wanting to become a professional brewer. Yep, yep. So let's start off at the homebrew level. If you are a home brewer, which most of the people listening to this program are, mm-hmm. and you want some formal education other than just listening to podcasts, uh, what opportunities are there out there? Well, I'd say the perfect uh, program is um, uh, the Advanced Home Brewing course, uh, which is put on by the Siebel Institute in conjunction with and at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Uh, it's every summer, the third week in July in, as I said, Durango, Colorado. And it's a beautiful time of year to be in Durango. And uh, there are five breweries in town, so we have a different uh, brewery to go visit uh, every evening. 
Uh, oh, did I mention I'm on the faculty for that course? <laughs> um, <laughs> Randy, Short, that's uh, Randy Mosier and I uh, do do the uh, the heavy lifting on uh, most of the brewing stuff, and then we're assisted by uh, Chris White, who teaches the uh, microbiology section, and Chris Graham from Beer, Beer, and More Beer, uh, who talks about equipment and does a uh, a day of uh, hands-on brewing uh, with the students as well. So no, so no slouches on the staff. Uh, week of um, brewing knowledge. It is uh, all grain oriented. Uh, so a lot of folks come who have been brewing for a while and, and are getting ready to make the leap into all grain brewing. Uh, some folks who've been all grain brewing but don't understand necessarily uh, all the theory and background of what they're doing when they brew uh, come to get that stuff. Uh, we do some styles uh, component there, only I think that's just a couple hours in that program. Um, good good yeast uh, uh, knowledge, fermentation stuff. You know, overall a well-rounded uh, program uh, that covers all the bases on brewing. And uh, I think the program has been sold out uh, the last two or three years. Mm. And they've been doing, I think they've been doing it for four or five years now. Randy started out doing all the uh, all the main lectures himself, and, and after two years, he, he called me up and said, "Help! I can't. I can't do all of this by myself." He was on his feet eight hours a day for five days straight. So, so yeah. So we we do that together now. But that wow. that's a great program. And what else is out there? Um, let's see. Um, for the folks, uh, I, the Siebel Institute does a number of other programs as well. Uh, they've got a two-week concise course uh, that's a classroom-based uh, program, uh, which is intended to be sort of an overview for uh, executives, uh, people new to the brewing industry, so forth. Uh, that's a good starting place for a lot of home brewers. Uh, of course, their big course is the, the diploma course, the World, World uh, Brewing Academy, uh, which is a 13-week long course that includes a, a tour in Germany. Uh, and class uh, classroom time over there as well. Those are the big ones that get into the professional end of the things. Um, gosh, other things for homebrewers. You know, Siebel does have a um, an online um, concise course as well that might be an option for some folks. Um, the American Brewers Guild, um, uh, run by Steve Parks, um, uh, up at uh, Otter Creek, uh, Wolliver's, the Wolliver's Otter Creek Brewery um, in... Um, uh, Vermont is is another option, and uh, Steve runs runs a good program. I think his program is mostly online. Occasionally, he does do a classroom uh, portion. Uh, his program, like most of the Siebel uh, courses, uh, is oriented towards professional preparation. Um, well, we can talk. We can talk about professional preparation as well. I mean, if you're if you're a home brewer and you're wanting to go pro and you want to get some formal uh, background before you start going in and, and hunting a job or starting your own brewery what, what's out there right um, well th- all right let, let's so we've talked about you know there, there's the American Brewers Guild and there's there's Siebel and those are basically sort of trade school programs as I said the thir- the, the Siebel's is a 13 week you know classroom based uh, Chicago and, and Germany uh, pretty intensive you know, eight hours a day uh, of lecture, exams at the end of the week, and there is, you know, there are, you do have to meet academic standards uh, to graduate. Uh, the American Brewers Guild program, as I said, I think is uh, primarily a correspondence program. I think it's got uh, good content and rigor, but I've never taken it and, and, and never, you know, uh, really questioned anybody closely about their experience with it. So I would, I would urge you to, to track them down and give Steve a call and talk to him about his program as well. Um, now those are sort of the trade school options if you're trying to, you know, be sort of a six month wonder or a, a four month wonder to, to <laughs> become a brewer. For those who may be younger and, uh, have a, a broader, uh, educational perspective, um, uh, the university based brewing program in the United States is at the University of California, Davis, um, in Northern California, not far from Sierra Nevada. And not far from a bunch of uh, great breweries there in Northern California. And UC Davis has a uh, undergraduate fermentation program 
although my understanding is their undergraduate program doesn't really offer anything specific to beer. Hmm. Um, they also offer a master's degree in fermentation that does offer a beer-specific track, as I understand it. Um, so UC Davis is, is the uh, university-based program uh, in the United States. And for years and years, uh, that was, you know, uh, you, you went there, and the main option when you left was to go work for Bud Miller or Coors. Mm -hmm. um, these days, of course, uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, career uh, credential for anybody who's going to work in the craft brewing industry as well. Um, great example of that is Mitch Steele, uh, who is um, uh, late of uh, or, or recently at um, uh, Stone Brewing in California, and but prior to that was in Anheuser Busch, and prior to that was uh, with another another uh, craft brewer in California early in his career. So he's kind of bounced back and forth, uh, and we're we're real happy to have him uh, in the craft beer fold because uh, he's got great chops and uh, really knows what he's doing. Um, but so that, that's an example of somebody that's gone that route. There's also several people in the craft brew sector right now who really went big on the educational front and went to Germany hmm. and got their uh, brewing degree over there. And in Germany, Weihenstephan is the uh, brewing school. It's the technical university near Munich. And it's a, an ancient uh, brewing school, goes back, you know, hundreds of years. And uh, there's even a brewer's fraternity on campus that has its own, you know, membership and traditions and lineage. And um, uh, the really big names in, in brewing research are based at Vine Stefan. And uh, if you go there, you'll study with those guys and you'll come out with a credential that will be respected around the world uh, as a brewer. And I would imagine, and I would imagine the parties at the uh, Brewers Fraternity would be pretty good. Well, yeah, I did visit there once. I think on uh, on middle middle of the week, and as I recall, the freshmen uh, not only wear beanies, but they're required to wait on uh, the upperclassmen and, and visitors, so that uh, <laughs> you never never have to go empty-handed or lacking for <laughs> beer. Um, but that's that's the real deal. Uh, the other one that I should mention is uh, Harriet Watt University in Scotland. Uh, the the Weinstephan program, by the way, is all in German, so you will have to brush up on your German uh, to do that. Mm. Uh, but there's, you know, there are a number of people in the industry in the United States who who have done that. Uh, Dan Carey at New Glarus. Um, uh, oh man, it's a, I had them had them all there in my mind a second ago. But uh, there's there's um, there's a number of examples of guys in the craft industry uh, who've gone that route. And, and Dan started off with the big boys, and then and then started uh, they started their own brewery afterwards. Well, you know, I think those guys actually the guys I'm thinking. Well, Dan Carey did start it at, at AB. Um, the other guy, uh, Eric Warner, um, uh, who's at Flying Dog and is now like CEO of, of Flying Dog. Uh, I don't think he ever worked for one of the bigs. I think huh. he went straight to craft brewing. And um, um, Dan Gordon from uh, Gordon Biersch um, uh, is the other one uh, who's a Weinstephan grad. And because um, I, I remember, I remember being in a German bar with him in in, in Chicago and hear, listening to him speak German. <laughs> and uh, it was great. I could understand him because he has because he has such a broad American accent when he speaks German. <laughs> <laughs> Even I could understand it. Um, no, but uh, so those are guys that that have that have gone that route, and and they really know their stuff. And I'm sure there are others as well. I don't mean to be slighting anyone else uh, in the industry who who has also gone that route, but those are the three that that pop into my mind. Um, so I started to mention um, uh, Harriet Watt in Scotland as well, and of course that's English or something pretty close to English at least um, that they speak there in Scotland. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure you get calls about that, and I'll get angry email. Um, I'm joking, really. Uh, but Harriet Watt has a residence program uh, in brewing and distilling, uh, and I believe both undergraduate and graduate. I know they have a graduate program. I'm fairly sure they have an undergraduate program as well. They also have a uh, international correspondence course uh, that is that is a heavy duty course, and you can get a master's degree in brewing and distilling from Harriet Watt, um, as long as you're patient, <laughs> mm. Be, because the, the courses are not, you know, they're not a push. I, I was enrolled in this program uh, for a while. I guess technically I still am, but I, I haven't done anything in a couple of years. Mm. 
Um, and you know the programs are quite quite rigorous, and the examinations are are, are quite intensive. Um, but it does lead to a full master's degree in uh, in brewing. And uh, when you complete that program, you get, I believe, you automatically receive the associate level uh, certification from the Institute of Brewing and Distilling uh, in London, which is uh, sort of the one well-known international uh, certification on. Um, on brewing knowledge. <clears throat> One thing that uh, that I want to mention before I forget, uh, we should probably mention that with the, the Brewers Guild here in the States, uh, there is an apprenticeship program with Otter Creek, is there not? Yep. I, I, I know they do some apprentice stuff. I'm not sure. Is it only at Otter Creek these days, or are they still involve some other breweries? I don't know. That's the one I know about. Yeah. At, at one point, they had a whole sort of network of breweries they were working with uh, around the country, uh, so that you know, even if you were in California doing it as a correspondence course, you could find a brewery near you to go uh, to go apprentice with. Uh, yeah, there's there's no question that's a, a valuable feature uh, when it comes to uh, you know developing a career. Having having had even just a, a few weeks of uh, experience in a brewery can can be certainly helpful in getting your foot in the door. Yeah, what what is your feeling about uh, professional brewers who are out there who have actually had Formal training. Do you have any idea in, in, in kind of a ballpark estimate of a of a percentage? Oh boy, you know I don't. Um, I mean, just your feeling. You know, when you go into the the breweries and or you know the brewers that you know, you know how many have actually uh, you know come up through the ranks at breweries and how many have have gone through the you know the the formal educational uh, route. Well, you know, I think I think it's a mixed. You know, everybody has has some mixture. Um, you know, because we've talked about the big programs, there's also you know smaller things like like the the Siebel Concise course. There's a sensory evaluation course. There's a microbiology course. Um, there's a master of beer styles course. So so there's a bunch of things that people can do. And I know, um, you know, when I was uh, casting about trying to get my Education. Uh, UC Davis used to do. Uh, I think they used to do a two-day uh, seminar uh, before the Craft Brewers Conference that I took at one point. Uh, that's the first place I ever saw uh, Michael Lewis uh, present. And um, you know, those are certainly very informative, and you can learn a great deal in a short period of time uh, through those programs. Um, so a lot. I think a lot of people have some, you know, training. Uh, at various places, um, and uh, a small, much, much, much smaller number, of course, have one of the full-on degree programs from Harriet Watt or Weinstephan or, or or Davis. So, there, so there's plenty out there. If people, plenty of options, uh, both large and small, uh, for people who who want to get some formal education out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think the tough part in terms of the residence programs are, well, like any residence program, you know, you got to you got to go where the program is. It's not not necessarily going to be in your backyard. But but there are correspondence courses. You know, Siebel's got one, uh, Harriet Watts got one, the American Brewers Guild. So uh, there's stuff that you can do uh, online these days as well. Well, Ray, I, I've enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate you coming on again. <laughs> Well, I, I, <laughs> you were lucky to get a, a, a word in edgewise the way I was going on. <laughs> hopefully, what? hopefully it uh, it's been informative for your listeners and uh, uh, covered the ground you wanted to cover. Well, those, those are my favorite kinds of guests. You know, I can just sit back and <laughs> sip on some water and, and let you talk. So, <laughs> well, best of luck with the Cicerone program. And thanks uh, very much. Anybody who uh, wants to check it out, come by uh, Cicerone dot org and uh, give us a look. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. All right, James. Take care. Well, thanks again to Ray Daniels for coming on the show. I hope that his program has a a positive, wide-ranging impact. It's uh, certainly very much needed. You can learn more and uh, take the sample quiz yourself at Cicerone.org. That's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-E dot O-R-G. And I'll put a link to the Cicerone program in the description of this episode on BasicBrewingRadio.com. Well, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from and check your email address make sure it's correct. The uh, 2008 Brewers Logbooks are still here, still got a few left. You can check them out on our site, 
And you can also check out our new low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD, where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash, and you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer here in northwest Arkansas, where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. But I do use a brew hauler. So, <laughs> uh, there are also our original DVDs in a Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through all grain brewing from uh, milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we do a nonlinear navigation there, so you can do infusion mashing or, or step mashing, or you can do uh, batch sparging or fly sparging. So, and you can always, you can always uh, come back through the chapter list and see all of the chapters or each of the chapters anytime you want. Uh, we've also got new combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And uh, I really appreciate everybody who's been uh, taking advantage of our store. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs at their stores on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our new and improved online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Remember, we also have shirts and hats, including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click uh, on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Color Rubber Band Lime Green Ponytail Holder and Bad Livers Hogs on the Highway. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support there. Well, that's all until next week. Till then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down there in Austin, Texas, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long.